All right, let's have some fun with hyperbolic functions. They don't sound like fun, but they're really not that bad. Um, it's hyperbolic sine and hyperbolic cosine that we're going to focus on. And of the two, hyperbolic cosine is probably the most useful because if you notice the shape of hyperbolic cosine on the right, that is actually the shape that's formed if you take a string between your two fingers and let it hang down. It might look like a parabola, but it's actually not. It's actually hyperbolic cosine. So what are hyperbolic sine and hyperbolic cosine? First of all, I'm going to stop calling it those long names. I'm going to call them cinch and cosh. So cinch is e to the x minus e to the negative x all divided by 2. And cosh is simply e to the x plus e to the negative x over 2. And these are what the two graphs look like. Again, these are just e to the stuff. It's not hard to graph these. And, of course, we're in calculus, right? So what we're going to first do is, oh, what's the derivative? What's the rate of change of hyperbolic sine and hyperbolic cosine? I lied. I used that one more time. All right, if I take hyperbolic sine, if I take cinch, and I take the derivative, and I take those e to the x and minus e to the negative x, and divide them each by 2 and separate them, do them the derivative separately, I get e to the x plus e to the negative x all over 2. And of course, that is just cosh, which shouldn't surprise us, because the derivative of sine is cosine, and it's kind of nice that the derivative of cinch is cosh. Well, what about the derivative of cosine? This is a little surprising. If I take the derivative of cosh, I end up with not the derivative of negative cinch, but actually just cinch. So unlike the derivative of cosine of x, which is equal to negative sine x, the derivative of the hyperbolic cosine is actually positive hyperbolic cosine or hyperbolic sine. So just one little difference, and it's actually kind of an easier one, because now we don't have to keep track of what's positive and what's negative. I do want to give two quick examples to remind you that all the other rules that we came up with before, like the chain rule, they don't go away. So if I looked at the hyperbolic cosine of x squared, that would be um, cinch x squared times the derivative of x squared, which is 2x. Likewise, if I did the derivative of hyperbolic cosine of x squared, that would be 2 times hyperbolic cosine times the derivative of hyperbolic cosine, which is hyperbolic sine. So don't throw out all the old rules. We've just now added two new derivatives to the mix. If I wanted to integrate these hyperbolic functions, they work the same way. If I had something like the integral of x times cosh of x squared dx, I would let u be x squared. I would let du be 2x dx. What I have is x dx, so I would solve for that. So I would replace x dx with du over 2. I would go ahead and solve that. Integral of hyperbolic cosine is simply hyperbolic sine. And again, we would substitute our u back in. And don't forget the plus c. We still have plus c's. So not too bad. Of course, we're going to have to talk about inverse hyperbolic functions because we had to worry about inverse sine and inverse cosine. So let's first look at, again, the shape of cinch, the shape of hyperbolic sine. This is a one-to-one -one function. Sine wasn't. We had to worry about the domain of inverse sine, and that's the thing that everybody trips up on. But we don't have to worry about that in the case of hyperbolic sine because it is already a one-to-one -one function. So the domain and range of the inverse hyperbolic sine is just going to be positive infinity to negative infinity. Let's see what this looks like. So this is a not so nice picture of the inverse hyperbolic sine. It's because Desmos, I couldn't easily get it to graph it, so I just took a picture. But again, the domain is all real numbers, as is the range. Now what? Yeah, we're going to find the derivative of hyperbolic sine. Um, but unfortunately, this is going to involve everybody's favorite technique, which is implicit differentiation. Let's jump in. So we have y equals the inverse of hyperbolic cosine x. So I'm going to rewrite that as x equals 
hyperbolic cosine of y, and I'm going to take the derivative of both sides. The derivative of the left-hand side is just 1. The right-hand side, again, I'll have to use the chain rule, and the derivative of hyperbolic sine is hyperbolic cosine, but then I have to do the chain rule, so it will have to be multiplied by the derivative of y. I'll solve for, solve for y prime. We're great, except we want this in terms of x. We don't want y prime to be given in terms of y. So what do we do? We're going to use something very close to the Pythagorean theorem for sine and cosine, but it's slightly different for hyperbolic sine and hyperbolic cosine. Sine squared x plus cosine squared x is 1. However, with hyperbolic functions, it's cosh squared minus cinch squared, and that equals 1. And you can see the algebra I've done to show that is in fact true. How somebody came up with to prove that initially, I'm not quite sure, but it doesn't matter. I can prove that it is in fact a true statement. So we're going to go ahead and use this Pythagorean identity to help us solve cosh y in terms of x. So I rewrite that equation in terms of just cosh of y, and I get that cosh of y is equal to the square root of 1 plus cinch squared y. But we know that x is in fact cinch of y, so that means that y prime is simply 1 over the square root of 1 plus x squared. And that's the derivative of cinch. That's the derivative of a hyperbolic sine. If we compare this to the derivative of inverse sine, you'll notice it's pretty darn close, except there's subtraction instead of addition when we're talking about inverse sine. So it, again, I like comparing the two. They're similar, but not quite the same. If I move on to hyperbolic cosine, I've said that I wouldn't say that very often, but I'm saying it over and over again. Again, cosh, hyperbolic cosine, same thing. Cinch, hyperbolic sine, same thing. Now, Hyperbolic cosine is not, in fact, one-to-one. -one. So we're going to have to limit the domain and range of what we use for the hyperbolic cosine, just like we did with sine and cosine, to find its inverse. You can only have an inverse function if the function is one-to-one. -one. So we're going to look at the domain of hyperbolic cosine by being one to infinity, although not quite one, really close to one. And the range will be zero all the way to infinity. We would do the exact same technique to find the derivative of inverse hyperbolic cosine. I won't put you through it, but just trust me that it's the square root of 1 over x squared minus 1, and it would be the exact same method that we did previously.